Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We're an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we are with one of our favorite guests, Dr. Stephen Eric Bronner from Rutgers University. And we're in his lovely Fort Lee apartment here, penthouse apartment, uh, with a bookshelf behind us that's just amazing and wonderful. And um, we're going to talk about, as we always do, the critical issues of our time. Uh, in this particular day, we're in uh, the month of March of 2018. Donald J. Trump is president of the United States. Uh, there's talk of increasing authoritarianism in the country. One of our concerns has always been with intellectual life, cultural life, social life, and you're one of the key figures in this as one of the advocates of critical theory, uh, which is something that a lot of Americans don't even know what that is, but we want to try to educate people with our show and be a platform for real learning. You're also very much an expert on the arts. You have a strong interest in the arts and culture. This is one of your books, Stephen, Modernism at the Barricades. Let me hold it up. Aesthetics, Politics, and Utopia. That's a word you don't hear too much these days, utopia. That's one of, one of your books, uh, one of your many books. Uh, another book, one of my favorite books of yours, in fact, this book, I was reading this on the bus ride from Hoboken, okay, on the 89 bus. Claudia and I took a bus ride to Fort Lee, and this is actually, it's called Critical Theory, A Very Short Introduction. We highly recommend it. And this is a second edition that just came out, yep. the new edition of this, Critical Theory. Um, here's a book that also recently came out about you, okay, and it's called Rational, Rational Radicalism and Political Theory. Rational Radicalism and Political Theory, Essays in Honor of Stephen Eric Bronner, edited by Michael J. Thompson, one of your former students, and there is a blurb by Cornell West, a wonderful blurb by Cornell West on the back, and, and finally, here's a book you wrote about Obama called The Bitter Taste of Hope, Ideals, Ideologies, and Interests in the Age of Obama uh, by Stephen Eric Bronner. So just some of your recent work, okay? Um, just let's check in with the, the professor today and see what are your thoughts about what's happening uh, in our country and in terms of the intellectual and cultural life and how can we strengthen it? You know, Alan B Bloom wrote that book, The Closing of the American Mind in 1987, and uh, there's talk of dumbing down. How do, we, how do we enrich people's intellectual and cultural life? Yeah, you know, I always thought he sort of uh, yeah. swiped that title um, uh -huh. from Herbert Marcuse, who wrote about the closing of the political universe. It's a chapter of One Dimensional Man, okay. but that's all right. That happens. Um, yeah. So w you mentioned authoritarianism, and I'm actually just writing a piece as we speak called The Gangster State. And the usual view of authoritarianism is that this is... Um, sort of uh, this involves a dictatorship by the military or a, a straight up um, uh, trend that when you think of authoritarianism that leads to totalitarianism and the like. Um, and, but above all, authoritarianism speaks to a new state formation. The gangster state, I think, is something a little different. Um, I think, uh, or at least in my view is, that this is almost like an adaptation. This is not a, a, a state with a, or a, uh, a leader with an explicit ideology. In fact, I, I think he prides himself on not having an explicit uh, ideology. I think that what this is, is, um, if I can put it this way, a group of thugs who are running, uh, who have has sort of adapted their uh, internal syndicate to the uh, democratic state or the liberal democratic state. And this has created tensions. This isn't simply Ill what's called illiberalism or what intellectuals have called the liberalism. I think this is something different. And I think what Trump offers uh, is the following. Um, what seems to be occurring, and you could see it in this tax bill, is that the, uh, 
the capitalist class is shrinking. The amount of, uh, the amount of funds on this tax bill that is going to 1%, under 1% of the, actually under 1% of the population, uh, is, is enormous. It's 80% of this $1.5 trillion bill. Now, in a certain way, what this, uh, what this means is also that consumption is becoming more and more constrained to a higher... Um, uh, to a higher economic stratum. In other words, fewer and fewer people are buying more and more. Mm-hmm. So, so, so to speak, the ruling class is shrinking. What Trump, I think, offers is, fo- is the following. He offers a way of protecting this stratum with a mass base that is completely um, loyal to him. Uh, And that's real. Uh, In a condition where uh, the ideology of the Republican Party has virtually vanished, where they've taken in Trump after the uh, Obama years, uh, where they've opened up to the Tea Party, which uh, constitutes his base, he's in a very interesting situation. There's a reason why he wants to keep mobilizing that base. And there's also a reason why he, uh, with his attacks on voting rights and support for Citizens United and the like, um, he basically wants to undermine the democratic rights of average citizens. So you have a mobilized core, right? His people are mobilized, ideologically mobilized, and ideologically committed, they're going to go out and vote. Mm. And if nobody else does, Mm. (laughs) it can look very bad. It can be very bad. He provides that to a shrinking uh, capitalist uh, elite. Mm. And, of course, he gets his cut. Mm. Everybody gets their cut. Uh, it's been estimated that his family is going to make thirty million dollars from this down the million road. Or billion. Million. Million. Okay. Oh, I mean, a lot. Million is... <laughs> works for me. Um, thirty million on this tax bill, and, and of course, there's there's going to be other stuff that comes along with it. Mm. I mean, mm. think of the scandals that are involved here. Um, in this, with this administration, we think back to President Obama. There was nothing in eight yeah, years. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? here, every day a new scandal. Uh, every day turnover in the government, mm. uh, for good reason. Every day a new indictment or thoughts or uh, thoughts mm. of a new indictment. We have a continuing chaos, and there's only one person who can. Um, who can save us from the chaos. That's the authoritarian gangster and his syndicate. And, you know, I just read some... Uh, I, uh, I just read... I have to admit I forgot where, but I literally just read... I think it was Roger Stone who said... Uh, who issued a warning to those who would really criticize... Uh, Criticize Trump in the uh, uh, in the Congress, which is you may not be living long. Mm. This is a low-level version, uh, an organizational copy mm-hmm. of Murder Incorporated. Mm. At least as I see it, mm. you have one guy who's the uh, pre, uh, primus mm. inter pares, first among equals, and then you have another set of gangsters below him. And the idea that we have the adults, uh, John Kelly and mm-hmm. uh, Mac, uh, McMaster and the military guys, the adults in the room, this is just crazy. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to warrant this kind of assessment that I can see. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you lie down with dogs, you get fleas. <laughs> It's interesting because we we were talking a lot about cultural things before we started the show and we sort of agreed not to go to Trump. (laughs) 
But everything just goes that way. And I was like, how do you avoid Trump? Is are we getting are we overdosing on Trump now in the culture? Is it just, are, are we reaching a tipping point? Are people are just going to say enough is enough. Uh, I think so. I mean, there there are a number of elements on this. It's been estimated that even during the campaign, Trump got three billion dollars worth of free publicity. Uh, you know, in, in publishing, you always uh, it's always uh, yes. better to be attacked than ignored. Ignored. Okay. Yes. Yes. So if all you see is Trump, mm. uh, which parts of the Democratic Party are quite happy with, mm -hmm. uh, they think this will just repulse everyone. Nevertheless, uh, you have a situation where there is a domination of the entire media by this one guy. Mm. This is all people see, all people know, and uh, the consequences are obviously very dangerous, especially if you don't have a uh, coherent alternative program in place to mobilize your own voters, and especially the core progressive voters. Wow. I was talking to my friend Matthew Bornstein on the phone the other day who lives on Delancey Street in the Lower East Side, and he's on this whole Einstein kick, you know, that, you know, he said, do you know Einstein was a socialist? I said, yeah, he said, but if only more people knew this, he said, hey, this would change everything, you know, and, and uh, he wrote an essay, Einstein, on why I'm a socialist. So why don't more people know that Einstein was a socialist, and like, d d does the left do a bad PR job of getting its message out, where the right is much more effective? Well, I mean, as you know, the uh, left really doesn't control the media exactly. Um, but at the same time, we don't have many programs that seek to educate our public. And in my view, the mainstream left, MSNBC and uh, the like, is just not doing that. They're not doing their job. As they They're do. not doing their job. Okay. There's, there is, from what I see, no real political education going on in terms of our traditions, in terms yes. of structural analyses of events. Mm. Um, it's actually disgraceful. Um, I, with regard to Einstein, uh, I'm no expert on, on him, but of course he's, uh, from the standpoint of uh, the mainstream and uh, the culture industry, you have Einstein, this fuzzy-haired guy, um, on, a lot of po uh, on a lot of posters looking like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. um, but he was, uh, he was a symbol for uh, what's best about, civil, uh, in my view anyway, what's best about civilization. Mm. He was a socialist in, uh, in economic terms. He was a liberal in political terms. And he was a cosmopolitan, a genuine cosmopolitan. Mm. My old teacher, Henry Pachter, yes. um, I'll tell you a story with Einstein, okay. uh, which he told me. Now... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, now, this is a uh, pen and ink by Henry Pachter's uh, uncle. His name was Heinrich Struck. And Struck was, in, uh, was a Zionist um, socialist in, in Germany in the 20s. And he was friendly with Einstein. And Henry Pachter, my former teacher, uh, he was, of course, like your friend Matthew, yes. uh, totally taken as a, as a young boy with Einstein. Mm -hmm. So I think when he was 13 or a, a kid, uh, his uncle said, I have a surprise for you. I'm going to take you to meet Einstein. Oh. So they, uh, Einstein lived uh, a, a ways from Berlin in an island called Kaput and um, they took the boat uh, had made a day of it and wound up at Einstein's house and Einstein opens the door and he says hello young man um, and he invites him in and I don't know, talks for 10 minutes or what, what 15, whatever the amount of time. I mean, Einstein's busy, okay. right? Okay. So uh, <laughs> then he says, 
you know, let me bring you a little a little present for your birthday. So Henry, who's at that time was very interested in mathematics, he actually was uh, always interested in the history of science. Um, was thinking, oh wow, I'm going to get. Uh, he was interested in mathematics and physics. I'm going to get a copy of the uh, of his general theory. Right, e equals m c squared. Precisely. <laughs> um, so Einstein comes back um, with a you know a young uh, a young adult book of some sort, and Henry's sort of disappointed. But you know, he shows it. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Einstein, so on and so forth. Uh, Einstein, who's probably had enough of both of them at this point, um, you know, leads him to the door. They leave, and then Henry looks at the book, and he sees a dedication. And the dedication said the following: um, "Young man, always remember, uh, a good heart is better than a good mind." Isn't that wonderful? Beautiful, beautiful. And you know, I, oh. you know, Einstein not only was he a socialist. You know, he used to hold classes in the workers' uh, quarters in in Berlin, communist uh, areas, Neukölln, uh, Wedding. And um, Henry told me that uh, the communists would um, attack him for being a relativist rather than a dialectical thinking. This is, you know, average workers and so on. And he said that Einstein was always uh, very polite and very, uh, um, very uh, open with these guys. But if there was an intellectual or a, uh, you know, person who knew better, made the, who made that kind of critique, or a, a dogma, a critique out of, a, born of dogma, then he really let him have it. And Einstein always, uh, uh, was, you know, he was, uh, even his, his Zionism, he was basically for a, uh, for a one-state solution, uh, for uh, um, a real type of, uh, of cooperation with uh, the Arabs in, uh, in Palestine. He was a remarkable man. One of the great, really the great men of uh, of history, in my view. Wow. Well, this is wonderful. This is, um, and again, this is knowledge that we're not getting on our mainstream media. We're, like you said, we're not getting this. And I'm still hoping that maybe, maybe uh, someone like uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, who has had your friend on, uh, Francis Fox Piven, you know, maybe he'll see this and say, okay, this is somebody who should uh, have a broader uh, audience. Um, but don't feel bad because I, my latest venture is theater. Now I have created, I have created a one-man show where I get to try to get some ideas across, but also be entertaining, but in a theatrical way. Okay. Uh, now, my first incarnation of this was in 2016 at the Church of Humanism on Central Park West. I called it How to Be an Actor in Your Own Life. I had about a dozen people there. But as a result of that, I got connected to Richard Dreyfus, the actor, who also has a civics project, and uh, which includes bringing back the Enlightenment tradition and uh, creating a museum dedicated to the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so I told Richard about you and your work, and he's very intrigued. What is uh, your take on the Enlightenment and what Richard Dreyfus is doing, and how do you think this could be relevant in terms of civics education and the Enlightenment? Um, well, uh, first, uh, with regard to your one-man show where you had a dozen people in the audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was 1978. I was at the first Walter Benjamin conference. I was giving a paper. This was at the uh, University of Kentucky in uh, Lexington. And uh, I remember the uh, there were people like um, Anson Robinbach and uh, uh, I think Andrew Arado was there. Uh, a lot of people who were who really were uh, sort of the American uh, 
uh, transmitters of Benjamin's thought and critical theory. I think there were more people on the stage than in the audience. Okay. And today, uh, today Benjamin's yeah, today Benjamin's writings, each volume sells uh, multi thousands of copies. I mean, he's the icon of the left. So that that could happen to you too. Thank you so much. Oh, Who knows? A little shot of hope. A little shot of hope, yes. exactly. <laughs> and now, what was the other thing that you raised? Uh, Mr. Dreyfus? Oh, Mr. Dreyfus and the, uh, and the Enlightenment. Now, I don't, I, I, I don't know uh, uh, Richard uh, Dreyfus except as a terrific actor. Um, and I know from you that he's uh, uh, sort of committed to, uh, I, as I understand it, particularly the American Enlightenment, the American version. And uh, this can only be good. The uh, the Enlightenment was a cosmopolitan project. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson read Kant, Kant read Rousseau, Rousseau read Locke. Uh, this was a, uh, a really a transnational enterprise mm. of uh, of intellectuals, and this is uh, today there is. Uh, much uh, written about the Enlightenment. Now there's a, a book by uh, Stephen Pinsker, Pinsky? Uh, oh, oh. Pinsker uh, from Australia called Enlightenment oh, okay. Now, which is a, a disaster. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, just oh. because what's, uh, and it's typical. Uh, what's really important about the Enlightenment is its ethos. Mm -hmm. It's not simply this or that thinker. It's not. Uh, uh, this or that theory, although they're great thinkers and great theorists, whether it's Kant or uh, John Locke or Voltaire, or mm -hmm. I mean, wonderful figures. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the ethos, mm. and uh, what uh, and that ethos revolves around some very very simple things, or uh, simple points, which in the age of Trump. Mm -hmm. mm. I think are of mm -hmm. enormous importance. So what are those points? Mm -hmm. Those points are first of all uh, an, an emphasis on, on moral autonomy, the moral autonomy of the individual. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's up to us. It's not simply enough to, uh, to talk about uh, politics or uh, even economics. We have to talk about ethics, and we have to talk about how a socialist politics and a liberal, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, social, uh, a socialist economics and a liberal politics, bringing the two together, uh, makes us not only uh, sort of richer or more materially satisfied, or, or simply helps the disadvantages, it also affects the way we live and the social relations we have that exist between people. Uh, that may be considered a utopian moment. I think it's crucial. And I think that's what the Enlightenment in a, in a fundamental way is about. It's not simply about optimism. Uh, it is about some commitment to human decency, to anti-dogma, to uh, demanding justification for political and uh, uh, philosophical claims. It's for a standpoint which basically is not bounded by uh, or not simply grounded in the emotional loyalties to this or that provincial uh, uh, tribe or a religion or nation. It's, it has a cosmopolitan vision. It always did. Uh, and it, it also speaks about the resistance to authority and the need to distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate authority. It raises the emphasis on critique in a uh, way that never existed before. And we're talking about the Enlightenment as a phenomenon that uh, uh, we're talking about the basically the 17th and uh, uh, 18th uh, centuries. That's of, of the Enlightenment, uh, and it's it was a uh, an ethos. The Enlightenment offered an ethos of uh, equality in the sense that everyday people could participate in their world. Mm. The, 
you don't get this simply out of this or that theorist. This is the connection of the Enlightenment to the age of democratic revolutions. From the English Revolution of 1688 to the, Amer uh, to the American Revolution, to the French Revolution, to the revolutions in South, uh, South America, of Simon Bolivar and the like. Um, that's the spirit of this. Um, when Kant wrote his, uh, his, cr uh, his uh, critique of pure reason, it was, uh, which is sort of a defense of science, but it, or a, uh, an analysis of science and its limits, he didn't believe science could, be, could turn into ethics. But he also didn't believe that religion should intrude, or even ethics should intrude into scientific analysis. It's time for us, I think, to become clear about what we want. Or to put it the way uh, Kant did, he said philosophy comes down to uh, th uh, three questions. What can I do? Uh, what can I know? What, you can, uh, what should I do? And for what can I hope? And uh, to try and provide humane answers to those questions, meaningful answers to those questions, that's what the Enlightenment's about. Wow. So uh, what, I'm just trying to think about what could be done in terms of education because that's that's my background is really teaching uh, and uh, we see this television show as an evolution of, of that teaching project of having a classroom uh, sort of transforming the television or the YouTube channel uh, the computer who's ever wherever you're watching us on screens flat screens or that this could also be a pedagogical space educational space critical space to learn to grow to get humanistic knowledge what about the institutions we call schools? What, do you, what, what kind of job are our colleges doing now in terms of getting out this humanistic education? Are they get, doing a good job, or are we increasingly becoming a technocratic-focused education system with business majors, fin people studying finance and marketing, and not getting this rich culture? I look at someone like a Donald Trump, and I say, well, you know, he went to the Wharton School of Business. And this is what they this is what they teach. They don't teach Enlightenment history. They don't teach any of that. Where would he get a chance to read Socrates if he it wasn't on the curriculum? So I want to sort of bring a, a broader critique of American education in terms of how are we going to empower people with this kind of critical knowledge that you have, that you're such an expert on. But what about the people out there that are not getting this? How can we get this into people's hands and minds and you know? Well, I, my view on this is, I guess, uh, um, a bit heterodox. Okay. I don't cut Donald Trump any slack for not knowing Socrates. Okay. Uh, the, a person who goes to an elite, a set of elite schools, mm -hmm. there's no excuse that he doesn't know this. Mm. Uh, and so what I'm going to say is that to a certain extent, for all people, no matter where they come from, mm -hmm. they have a certain, uh, in my view, uh, ethical and personal responsibility to make their world bigger. Um, you can uh, facilitate that through schools, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or you can inhibit it through schools. But... At some level, mm -hmm. the individual's responsibility for his education mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't be forgotten. And uh, here there's something else. It's just not hip to be, uh, to be an intellectual. I, mean, I, I sound terribly fuddy-duddy-like. Uh, preach it, preach it. All right, let me, and let me, I, I say this yeah. to my class all the time. Yes. If uh, kids felt, uh, or young people felt they could uh, get over with the opposite sex, or basically, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, hook up. Yeah. Uh, by knowing Hegel, everybody would be walking around with the phenomenology of mind under their arm. <laughs> but that's obviously not the case, and the school can't do anything about it. Yeah. This is, in a certain way, up to young people themselves, mm -hmm. and... Uh, the culture has to be in some way connected to a movement, whether incipient or ongoing, that 
uh, wants to change society. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the, I, I have to say, whatever the uh, mistakes we made in the 60s, mm. and they were legion, yes. uh, this idea that, that culture matters, mm. uh, that it's a fundamental part of growing up, mm. making your world bigger, yeah. reading, uh, as you like, as you emphasize all the time, uh, the, uh, uh, s- sitting in cafes yes. uh, and the like, mm-hmm. uh, that's not something the school can do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, that's part of the resistance. Mm-hmm. And if we don't have that, mm-hmm. the, resistance is gonna su- the resistance to authoritarianism is going to suffer. Wow. Because that's how you build your moral autonomy. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it's not just in the schools. One of my students uh, said, to, yes. uh, said to me the other day, uh, this was in an intro class, mm-hmm. and we had been talking about guns, and I put forward the position of um, a rather radical position, which basically said that almost all guns should be banned. Mm-hmm. That we were just narrowing the discussion to AK-47s and so on. Yeah, anyway, yeah. then immediately, then the class sort of took up that theme. And so yeah. one of the women, she was uh, in the class, there were about 100, 150 kids. But this was an older student. She said, look, you know, you said something as a professor, and the entire class just changed its opinion. Oh. And I said, that's exactly right. You're right. Oh. And that shouldn't be the case. But for that, there have to be outside, external mm. forces that build the opinions of, uh, of students, of young people, mm. of intellectuals. Mm. And it can't simply be the culture industry. Oh. It's got to be their own emphasis. Sure. We're constantly concerned about the artist, right, right. as uh, avoiding the culture industry. Oh, this person's special. This person's <laughs> radical. This per- All right, how many Bob Dylans are there yeah. uh, who can make that, that kind, of, who can negotiate mm-hmm. the uh, culture industry and uh, mm-hmm. the critique of it? No, the, it's not just about the artists. It's about the consumers. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, we forget that uh, uh, consumption is itself produced mm-hmm. by, the, by the culture industry. And it's up to young people, it's up to radicals and bohemians and intellectuals mm-hmm. to resist the production that happens through the, uh, the production of taste, the production of, uh, of consumption that occurs through the culture industry itself. Uh, At wow. least in my view. Wow. You're making me think of so many things. Um, One, when you talk about the cafe culture, I was teaching a a writing course at uh, Essex County College in Newark a couple of years ago, a basic composition course. So my students are basically students now who are working class, poor, black, Latino, Mm -hmm. come out of dysfunctional school systems, sitting in my classroom, hate to write because they've been subjected to pedagogies that have not been very helpful and come out of bad school systems. So I'm trying to get them into the intellectual life, you know. And one of my strategies was, uh, at the time, it's not there anymore, there was a wonderful cafe on Halsey Street in Newark, which is like a little bohemian strip of Newark there. And there was this wonderful cafe called the Art Kitchen Cafe. And I had a group of about 30 students, you know, Let's go. I want to take you. Do you know what cafe culture is? Nobody has any clue. So we come marching into this cafe, you know, like this army of inner city and the cafe people are like, what? You know, everybody was cool, though, you know, and this is what cafe life is like. This is what cafe life is like. And it's like a revelation, you know. So, yeah. But part of this also is I think um, it's not simply uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, playwrights and uh, poets is Bertolt Blecht, in sp- uh, and mm-hmm. Blecht had an uncanny ability to hit the uh, 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 the popular vein and the popular taste. Mm. So when he wrote the Three Penny Opera, mm. I, I knew people who were alive at the time it came out. Mm-hmm. And they said, of course, it was in the equivalent of, of, of Broadway in Berlin when it mm. appeared. But, so not everybody could afford it. Mm. But I was told that from one day to the next, 
like that, mm. everybody in Berlin is singing these songs to the Three Penny Opera. Uh, and but Brecht was this was also aside from being a popular writer, he infused his popular writing with great knowledge. When he wrote Saint Joan of the Stockyard, he studied he studied Das Kapital. He was a, a, a student in the cafe circle of uh, of Karl Korsch, the great uh, Western Marxist. Um, and we don't do that enough. We pander too much. Uh, for example, with vocabulary. Right, right, right. Yeah. Hegel uh, used to believe, and I think he was right that the extent to which you expand your vocabulary is itself a mark of progress. Mm. And the reason is very simple. Okay. The more you expand your vocabulary, the more precise you can be when you speak about something. Ooh, nice. yeah? Yeah. So, yeah. But what do we do? We do exactly the opposite. We shrink the vocabulary so that uh, you literally wind up in a situation mm. where it's unclear what anyone's talking about. <laughs> For example, yeah. uh, let me be vulgar. Okay. The term <laughs> Think of how many meanings this has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's now to the point where it has no meaning at all because right. it can mean anything. Right, 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 right. And uh, this, this has become a, to me, yes. a crisis. I mean, a, yes. a pedagogic crisis. There's a lack of vocabulary. You can see it in the Times, mm. in the New York Times. Just compare uh, the, the book review mm. from 20 years ago oh. to today. Oh, yeah. uh, you can see it in the, uh, in the vocabulary used in, in most TV shows and in movies. My dog, Phoebe, <laughs> has a vocabulary of... About, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's very important, yeah. and she also occasionally comes comes with me to uh, Rutgers. Uh, has excellent conversations with the students. Uh, so Phoebe uh, apparently has a vocabulary of about sixty words. Yeah. What's the average vocabulary of uh, an Amer uh, of uh, of an American? What about Donald Trump's vocabulary? Well, I'm I don't know. I think that's too facile. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about what is about, what is the vocabulary of so many people who criticize Trump? That's true too. Yeah. 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 yeah that's true. You know what it is? It's about six hundred words. Mm. Sixty words for Phoebe, my dog. Uh. 600 words right. for uh, sort of, I, I, I don't know how to put it, sort of average everyday people. And what happens even in college? Instead of reading Marx, we read uh, Marx for beginners. Instead of Freud, it's Freud for beginners. Instead of Einstein, it's Einstein for beginners. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. There are no shortcuts. Okay. And you got to put in the time. Wow, wow, wow. We got it from, we have our marching orders from the professor wow. here in Fort Lee, New Jersey. We have to read, read, read. Um, think, 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 think. Okay. Um, just reflecting here. Reflect, 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 reflect on my own Buildings Roman, which is a word we get from Goethe also, right? Um, if I hadn't gone to a psychoanalyst right down the block here in Fort Lee, <laughs> New Jersey, believe it or not, in 1985, when I I had dropped out of college and I was drifting and what should I major in and this and that. That was a that was a pivotal um, decision. No one understood you. Well, no, it was it was simply I believe in psychoanalysis. I think oh, it's God. important. That that's that that experience got me into Fordham University where I studied psychoanalysis and literature. I was an English major there, uh, eventually wound up in uh, uh, NYU and their groundbreaking program in English education in the mid-1990s, very social justice-based uh, program there. Uh, and, um, you know, and then found my way into circles like Judson Church in the Village, intellectual groups, the Left Forum, all of that development while I was teaching also, developing as an educator, the teacher must be taught. 
the teacher must be taught. And so you wonder, who is teaching our students? What are they learning? What are our students learning in school? Are they learning how to follow orders and be passive and just vote for twiddly D or twiddly dum? Or? It's a question that always comes up, right? And here, I guess, the first thing is we have to make some distinctions uh, when we talk about the educational system. There's got to be a difference between NYU or Rutgers or Princeton. Uh, so I'm talking about NYU as a top-rate private institution, Princeton as an Ivy League institution, top-rate, Rutgers as a... a a relatively recognized uh, state university, public university. These are all very liberal schools. And uh, the claim that these kind of schools are liberal, or at least liberal technocratic, is true, in my view anyway. However, this is only one part of the educational system. What about, you know, I don't know how things are at Rice, or at uh, Baylor, or at um, at Liberty. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I have no idea. Sure, sure. Um, but it's not good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, for our purposes, I think I think there are a few things that uh, that we have to be clear about. Not everyone has to uh, sit there and read the Bildungsroman of Goethe. Yeah. Uh, they should have the chance to do that, which is different. Um, but some people are just not interested in this. Yeah, that's true. They yeah. want, uh, and it's up to a, a university to provide for those interests as well as the interests you and I mm -hmm. uh, and Claudia uh, would probably uh, mm -hmm. embrace. Yeah. But not everybody's into that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Part of the problem of the university is that it's sort of a, a Marxian problem, weirdly enough, mm -hmm. is that the knowledge is lagging behind the production process. We have a production process that's becoming ever more specialized, ever more, mm -hmm. uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. The a division of labor is expanding, mm -hmm. uh, is growing, and for those technocratic uh, elements of, the, of our educational process. They're lagging behind. Everybody seems to say so. They can't place their students. Um, of course, we can't place our students either that well. God knows. And there's been a market, I mean, you know that, a market attack on the humanities. That's certainly that right. Happening? And the, yeah. A market attack on the humanities. I think Talk so. About maybe explain that better. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, for example, um, at Rutgers we uh, we used to have separate departments of Russian, German, um, I think other Slavic languages. These have been fused. Mm. There used to be a separate classics department. That's basically gone. Uh, it's been fused uh, with, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I forgot what it's been fused with, but some, uh, some kind of uh, uh, lit literature program. Um, political theory is, under, is, I mean, clearly shrinking through the discipline of political science, which has become more and more technocratic. And uh, part of the... Uh, uh, the the consequence of this is that everybody any, every time anybody comes up with an idea, it's like they're developing the wheel. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas it's usually been said before, but nobody knows that because there's no mm -hmm. th uh, theoretical education. And this is particularly true in international relations. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, but that's if that's basically that's what I mean. And yeah, that's wow. happened. And the finally. The majority of funds for uh, uh, research and development is going into online courses, 90%. So we're going to lose the social life. Yeah. Well, the ability to have face-to-face -face conversations. Well, you know, um, 
I want to turn toward hope because you're a student of Ernst Bloch, the great Ernst Bloch. Give us some hope, Ernst. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna turn a little bit towards that and hope. And uh, you know, here's something hopeful that I learned from your book. Okay, the one on critical theory. Right in the first chapter. Okay, you talk about how the first Marxist think tank. Okay. Uh, Institute for Social Research mm -hmm. was funded by a wealthy businessman named Herman Weil, right. who made money in the Argentina grain markets, right. and he had a son who was into Marx. Right, so he said, "All right, I'm going to fund this thing." So you do have enlightened wealth in capitalism. I read recently uh, in the New York Times that some wealthy business guy gave a hundred million dollars to uh, a college to the philosophy department in Duke University, a hundred million dollar grant. Now look, we got to save the world here, Still okay? Like beating heart. We got to save the world. Here's, here's my proposal right now on national television, okay? On national te Stephen Bright, we're going to start the Save the World Academy. You're going to be the dean. Save the World Academy. We're going to be the media for this, okay? We need a hundred billion dollars right now. Whoever wants to save the world, this is what is necessary. And how much do I get? <laughs> <laughs> You're the dean. You're going to be well taken oh, care okay. of. Right. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, I move forward. Right. We're joking in a way, but in a way, not really, because in, there is enlightened capitalism. And how, who who wants to see the world get boring and become taken over by autocrats? And that's what we're going to have if this situation continues and with the dumbing them. down. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, look. You know, Marx. Um, uh, said in the manifesto that uh, no revolution can occur unless part of the ruling uh, ruling class breaks off and joins the oppressed. And you, that's certainly true. Like, for example, uh, you know, in the uh, one always says in the American Revolution that uh, the founding fathers were all rich, mostly slaveholders and so on. That's true. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that they were part of the revolutionary uh, attack mm -hmm. on, on England, you know, and, and uh, were basically, for the most part, um, let's put it this way, anti-monarchical, anti-aristocratic, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and uh, sort of uh, proponents of enlightenment ideals, science mm -hmm. and the like. Um, that doesn't excuse the racism or the, any of the other stuff, but it's just something that has to be mm -hmm. taken into account. You know, and in the French Revolution, uh, the Abbe Sayez wrote the most influential pamphlet, What is the Third Estate? Mm -hmm. The Third Estate is the people. Mm -hmm. uh, the non-aristocrats, the non-churchgoers. Uh, non mm -hmm. You can think of the same thing with the Russian Revolution um, and the Chinese Revolution. Yes, we need uh, people who, uh, educated people, uh, people of the ruling class to break off and join the oppressed. But they're not going to rule the oppressed. You asked before who, no. to, who, uh, who educates the educators, as Marx put it also. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and there has to be some sense here that uh, the revolution is not for them alone. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. In other words, you're doing this out of an ethical purpose, right, right. and uh, you're there to help. You have to be honest. You say what you think. Uh, no pandering. No nonsense. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, um, mm. it's the disenfranchised and the exploited who make the uh, who make the changes, and uh, who lead the charge. Well, one thing I want to say now is, is something I, lately I picked up this idea that uh, I think it's Brian Williams, and he always starts every show at 11 o'clock on, on MSNBC by saying, it is day 415 of the Trump administration, as I think he, that's okay. I know, I know, it feels like forever. But also, in 1945, they exploded the first atomic weapon in the world, okay? So I like to say it is, it is year 73 of these horrible weapons that exist. 
and what can we do to get rid of them and why is it that no one's talking about that in the media we had a guest on our show Alice Slater who is is advocating to get rid of all nuclear weapons she was working with a group that just won the Nobel Peace Prize for this all right now it's like a, a complete blackout on this issue uh, Alice Slater, uh, um, I knew her uh, a few years ago, a wonderful woman, and um, uh, you're, you're c completely right. One of the things that happened under President Obama was the beginning of a major deal with, uh, with Russia to reduce uh, nuclear weapons by, I, I forgot the numbers now, but it's in the th tens of thousands. That, of course, has now changed under Trump. We have a renewed, um, we have a renewed uh, nuclear arms race, uh, which fits into the nationalism, fits into the protectionism, fits into all this, uh, all the stuff, um, and it's uh, it's a scandal that nobody's raising this because, and not and on top of it. You know, you mentioned the um, the 1905 dropping of the uh, bombs on 1945 on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, here it is. I mean, think of the way this looks to the outside. The United States alone is obsessed with Iran having a bomb and potentially using it alone with Israel. Mm. Uh, obsessed with uh, with Iran having a bomb, with using it, it lectures Iran mm -hmm. constantly. Uh, it uh, stands as the voice of reason as, as against these um, uh, supposed loons. Here it is: the United States is the only country that ever used the bomb, mm. lecturing a country yeah. and ready to uh, virtually bomb a country mm. that might be doing what we've already done. It's an amazing uh, display of arrogance. Well, we're winding up here. Claudia, how much time we have, dear? Uh, six minutes. I want to give a thank you to my lovely, darling wife, Claudia, who without her love and support, the show would not exist. So uh, very nice. love is an existential reality in the world. All right. Uh, we try to educate for a more caring society we say things like that on our show um and uh, what are you doing now steve to care for yourself let's talk about that in terms of what are you doing in terms of staying strong what keeps you uh motivated what keeps you uh focused in terms of maybe your own reading life or your own cultural life or teaching life what, what are you what are you doing uh to you know to feed yourself to feed your soul or feed your you know, spirit, if that's... Well, okay. that's actually a good question. Um, I'm listening to a lot of opera. Um, and, well, I, uh, my, my ch uh, particular choice is I'm, it's eclectic since I know so... Uh, I don't know enough about, uh, of, uh, technically, about music. Uh, but... Um, uh, Mozart. Um, I love Beethoven's Fidelio, which nobody else seems to like. Uh, you know, the, uh, one of the main uh, themes is justice. It's uh, yeah. It's a uh, it's a very and also a very gender progressive uh, opera, if I can put it that way. Um, on the other hand, I'm also uh, I also love Wagner. Yeah, and I love and on. And uh, and Rossini, those are my, I, I guess my core, my go-to people. Um, but um, I'm also uh, I also uh, try and read some, and I um, every you know every day. Literature? Are you getting into? I, I read I read literature and mostly I write uh, I read history. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I find that it helps me understand international international relations, mm. and also conflict resolution. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, okay. uh, the uh, I, I mean I know it sounds uh, I know it may sound sort of uh, 
again, fuddy duddy ish, perhaps. Uh, but. Um, we'll put up that second button there. Wait. Because... Uh, oh, all right. That's, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, my, my people in, in, in literature, even though I've written, uh, written about modernism, yeah. uh, I love modernist painting. Uh, that, uh, and I try and go to the museum. If, uh, whenever I go, can go, go to see the Carolee Schneeman at PS1 MoMA that's not fuddy duddy okay I'll check that's it out uh, <laughs> but um, mostly within the realist tradition um, yeah um, Balzac is an unending source of uh, really? inspiration yeah uh, and uh, so, and so is Dickens, Dickens in spite of his romantic uh, elements yeah what's your favorite novel by Dickens the Pickwick Papers, okay. yeah, which is his first, yes. made him a uh, made him a star, okay. yeah, and uh, of course uh, 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 Thomas Mann is, uh, wow. yeah. yeah. Wow. So someone asked me the other day, what are you, what are your two favorite novels? Yes, and uh, my answer was uh, The Magic Mountain. Uh -huh. And Sartre's, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's um, The Age of Reason. And I was in a conversation with a friend of mine in, in Berlin, the great editor of uh, Lettre International, it's called, which I think is the finest journal that I know, okay. into, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. magazine that's, that's out there, Frank Balbalish. Mm -hmm. And I it sort of it came up with your two favorite novels, and he said he said without me saying anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the same thing. Oh my! Isn't God. that interesting? Yes. Um, <laughs> so and Thomas Mann, I could just read constantly. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stephen. This has been such a great delight and pleasure to be with you. It's awesome. very, very stimulating as always. I like to say, in a better world, you would be more famous than Kim Kardashian. Uh, or even more famous than Donald Trump, because <laughs> so you keep up your good work, and eventually, you know, we'll we'll get there. Okay, be hopeful. Hope so. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.